Hey there, just before we get into the podcast, a quick reminder, we could use your financial help. Please support us on Patreon so we can keep on keeping on. Check the Patreon links to donate. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Welcome back to Talking Books. Talking Books and Writing and Stuff is what we do here. I'm Dennis Rimmer. On the line with us from somewhere in Alberta, we have Nancy M. Bell. And it's Nancy M. Bell for a reason. So first of all, Nancy, why the M? (laughs) Because my name is so common. Before I actually ever got published, I had a contract, but I hadn't been published. I got this nasty email from someone who just cussed me out for the language I had used in my book. And I emailed her back politely and said, I'm sorry, but that's not me. And, you know, sure enough, I went on, on Amazon and there was another author with my name. And so I said to her, this is, this is the person who wrote the book you were upset about. And she emailed me back and, and uh, accused me of lying. And I know it's you. And so I was like, okay, then. <laughs> So, so I use the M so that when people go to look for my books, they find me, and hopefully they realize that there's more than one of us with the same name. Right. Um, so there's no actual, uh, not a law, but a requirement that people can't use the same name as writers, I guess? Not like actors, where you have to have... Yeah, no, I don't think so. No, I'm obviously not. <laughs> so if I've been really smart, if I had it to do over again, I would just use my maiden name. Aha. Uh-huh. So that... Because it's... That would make it easier. Yeah. Yeah, it would have just been there. There's not that many of them, so. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, that's funny. That's the story about Nancy M. Bell. Uh, (laughs) But Nancy, let's start at the beginning. Uh, What's your story? Uh, Where are you from? Um, Why is writing important to you? Let's start with that. Okay. Well, I grew up in Ontario. Uh, just outside, it's sort of the outskirts of Toronto, uh, back in the day, because, you know, I'm older than dirt. Uh, <laughs> it was definitely the outskirts of Toronto. It was like West Hill, which is kind of between Scarborough and Pickering. Okay. If any familiar with the area. Uh, it's more built, way more built up now than it was then. Um, and then we moved, I got married and blah, blah, had kids. Moved to Alberta in 91 or 92, and we live um, sort of on a rural property between Calgary and Airdrie. It's roughly Balzac area, but Balzac is is no more now than kind of two churches and a general store. <laughs> well, at least the store is there, so you got the church for the one needs and the store for everything else, perhaps. So. Yeah, and a gas station. And a gas station. What else do you need? Exactly. <laughs> it sort of sounds like so, Radisson. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, as, I have always, always written, always, even when I was like a kid, and I think about it now and I'm like, what drove me to do that? But I can remember like being in public school and, and writing and composition was like my favorite class in the whole world. But I wrote poetry and I wrote short stories and I wrote um, in grade five or six, like seven maybe, um, one of our classes or requirements was we were supposed to write this story. So I wrote this massive story. I actually still have it, and I keep telling myself I'm going to redo it because, you know, obviously I had no idea what I was doing, and it's full of stuff that doesn't need to be there. But I just, I can't not write, if that makes any sense to you. Like, it just comes, and sometimes my characters wake me up in the middle of the night, and I have to get up and write it down, or I lose them. Uh Uh-huh. So it's just, I don't know, it's kind of just, it just happens, and I have no control over it. Um, I went, walked the dogs one day and came home with a poem. <laughs> so. <laughs> so your writing career began with poetry? A published uh, career? Poetry, just short stories, a lot of short stories. When I was in, um, later in public school and into high school, I had some short stories published in, you know, the local paper, the Scarborough Mirror, I think it was called. But, yeah, and, and after that, I didn't really have it much published until the 80s, and I had something accepted into, um, oh, what was it called? Horsepower. It was kind of a, 
a spin-off from the Corinthian, which is now Horse Sport, I think. But it was the Corinthian back in those days. And, and then I just, I don't know, I just, I have reams of stuff that I need to, you know, yeah. <laughs> so my, that was what the question was going to be. Did you read and write much as a child? So what about reading? Uh, did you have favorite uh, authors uh, way back then? Oh, yeah, I read voraciously. It was, uh, Will James was one of my favorites. Um, Smokey the Cow Horse. Anything with horses in it. Um, there was a buckle horse by, I can't remember his first name, but it was Anderson, and he also did the drawings, and it was amazing. Um, Walter Farley, obviously, with the Black Stallion series. Ah. Um, Trixie uh, Belton. I, I wasn't really a Nancy Drew fan, but Trixie Belton I read. <laughs> we have some Trixie Belton books downstairs. <laughs> yeah, like, it just I read, would read just about anything I could get my paws on. And it just, yeah, and if it had to do with horses, that was even better. Oh, gotcha. No horsing around with this woman. No uh, horsing around. Nancy M. Bell is with us today right here on Talking Books and talking about her writing life, but you also have a, another life as a publisher, so we'll get to that in a moment. So right now, what do you have out there on the bookshelves? Uh, I have uh, a YA series that is set... I'm mostly in Cornwall in the in the UK. It's about a little Alberta girl who ends up in Cornwall because her mom is sick, and it it um, deals a lot with a lot of uh, Cornish legends and myths and things, and Earth energy lines. And there's Earth energy lines that um, Jean Michel rediscovered in the early 70s, I believe, and they run from near Lands End across to into East Anglia, and so I. Use Oh, ignore my phone is ringing. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> and uh, it, she has to follow this line, and she has to solve that she gets at different places along the way. And so that's the first book in the series, and then there's two more in the series, and it's called The Cornwall Adventures. So it's um, Laurel's Quest, A Step Beyond, and Go Gently. And I'm just actually just launched, um, be a year ago, September now, actually, uh, a second series was based on the same uh, young girl, but she is back home at her ranch in Pincher Creek, and it's called a Wild Horse Rescue, okay. and that's the Alberta Adventures, and it basically deals a lot with, um, I transplanted the wild horses that are up by Sundry and Rocky Mountain House in Alberta here, down to Pincher Creek just to avoid anything because there's uh, quite a bit of controversy between the people who want the wild horses to be able to basically just be wild horses and live there and the ranchers who would really like to see them just gone totally so that's the premise of that book and then i'm working on the, the second in that series called dead dogs talk which is basically going to deal with the problem of uh, puppy mills and dog fighting rings oh boy yes yeah so that that's kind of the the focus of that series, although it's not all doom and gloom and gross stuff. No. I also have a um, romance series, a uh, contemporary romance, set in uh, Longview, Alberta, which is called, the first one, Storm's Refu Refuge, and it's actually done quite well. It just got released as an audiobook this year, which well, was kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's uh, Storm's Rescue, Storm's Refuge, and Come Hell or High Water, which is... Um, kind of rotates a bit around the Calgary Stampede and the flood that we had in Calgary in 2013. So yes. that's kind of where that title came from. And then um, in the third book, the, the two main characters get married, so it's called The Longview Wedding. Uh -huh. That's our cat in the background scratching on the door. He wants food, but he just had a snack. so. He can... Oh, well, that's okay, because my cat is looking very disgusted because I won't share my chair with him. <laughs> so when you talk about why a Nancy M. Bell, uh, why that's young adult, what uh, yes. what kind of age group is that really supposed to be? Yeah, that's, they've come up with this um, new adult thing, which is kind of like 18 to 21 or 25, and uh, YA traditionally was, you know, kind of like 13 to 18, and it, the, I don't know, the goalposts seem to keep moving sometimes. Exactly. Kind of like genre yes. changing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and so how many actual books then? Do you, you've got three, 
in oh, the Cornwall have, series. I have about 17 in total, I think. <laughs> I should keep track, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what's your daily writing routine then? Well, I, I also work um, part-time for an animal rescue doing cat adoptions. So I really um, work by my writing routine around them because I work four days on, four days off. Okay. So I, I kind of work my writing routine around there. And sometimes it's just whenever, you know, they kind of grab me by the throat and drag me to the computer and make me write their story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I don't sometimes know how... Right. I don't know how you you fiction writers do it because I I just I can't do that kind of stuff and I've tried so I'm like a non-fiction writer but uh, well sometimes I wish I couldn't <laughs> <laughs> oh dear so so I actually brought up my list because I never remember all these so the publisher BWL Publishing uh, Jude Pittman is actually the publisher and I kind of help her out and do a bunch of admin for her and some editing. So she started in uh, Canada's 150th, she started a pro, uh, a project, I guess it was, that she wanted to a book written, a historical novel written for every province and territory that dealt with the people who actually, you know, pioneered and opened up uh, Canada. So I wrote Ontario's one because I grew up in Ontario and someone had snatched Alberta on me already. Oh no. <laughs> yes. And then I ended up writing the Manitoba book, which is called Landmark Roses, uh, because the lady who was writing it backed out at the last minute. And my contribution to the project was like the second book in the series. So I was already done. I had, you know, done my bit. And so Jude asked me if I would do the Manitoba book because she wanted a specific story told. And that was of the uh, Mennonites who came from Europe and settled south of Winnipeg. Gotcha. Okay. yeah, so, of course, I knew next to nothing about any of that. So her daughter had a friend who actually is a Mennonite and grew up in that community. So Margaret uh, was is listed on the book as the second author, and basically she was she was my, my go-to because she grew up in that. And so she would catch anything that was out of, out of whack with what actually would have happened or what they actually believed. And I had access to her dad's. Uh, unpublished autobiography, which was just crammed full of all kinds of little nuggets I could pull out and kind of insert into my story, and so that was very interesting. And then I did the research for a third book in the series, uh, which was New Brunswick with uh, Diane Scott Lewis. And then I have, um, in Laurel's Quest, her grandmother, what her grandmother did in the past kind of affected a lot of what happened in that book and I had a lot of people ask me well what happened what about Grandma Bella what was what happened with her and what was her story so I actually wrote um, two books that dealt with her story one's called the Selkie song which is about how and why she met Laurel's grandfather uh, who turned out to be a mythical beast called a, a selkie, which is a shape-changing seal. They can change, it can be either male or female, but they can change by shedding their seal skin, become human, or go back to the sea. And so that book kind of tells the story of how she met him and then why she um, kind of got shuffled off as a, a, a bride to Alberta and married a rancher. And then Alberta, um, Arabella's Dreams kind of continues on with that. And then I also um, kind of ghost wrote, co-wrote. One of our authors uh, died a number of years ago, and his mu- his wife wanted his work to keep being in print, but it needed to be updated and it needed to be cleaned up. So I have uh, three books with him. And then he had written a short story called um, Must Love Big Dogs, or Large Dogs or something. And it's quite humorous, and it's told from the dog's point of view and how he... <laughs> maneuvers his mistress into doing what he wants her to do and kind of arranges her love life. So uh, she wanted it turned into a a novel, basically. So I took his 15 or 16,000 words and made it 50,000. And it's called The Teddy Dialogues. And it's it's quite, it's amusing. (laughs) He's quite the the creature. I kind of kept everything that that Pat had, had written about the dog, but I just enlarged on them and kind of, you know, added things in here and there. But basically... I, yeah, it's it's Pat's dog, and, and the basis nugget of that is definitely his story. And then I took a really left turn 
and I wrote a Jack the Ripper novel. Oh boy, you are which, all over the place, aren't you? <laughs> which was, um, it, well, it started out as a, pro, a joint project between another between another author and me, and uh, it didn't work out. So I had to kind of throw because she was writing a female person, a female shopkeeper that lived in Whitechapel, and I was writing Jack. And I did all kinds of research, and then we kind of, it died. It was, like, not working. But he wouldn't leave me alone. I needed to write his story, or this, whatever this story was, because he would keep bugging me. So I did a whole crap load more research, and I changed who he, who I had had him as originally. I had him as kind of like an accountant bookkeeper guy. Um, and, the, and the more I kind of did research and stuff that I... I thought, you know what, I think this guy actually lived in Whitechapel and he really wasn't maybe as educated, maybe, or... Anyways, I changed him and I turned him into a slaughter man who had had an evangelical father and it was his father that... And his father's ghost drives him all the time. And so, basically, it's it's not your typical Jack the Ripper novel where Jack is hiding or Jack is doing his deals and the cops are trying to catch him. And it's more, uh, it's actually more a little bit literary where it's basically who Jack the Ripper might have been and what made him the way he was. Okay. Um, yeah, it was, yeah. It was an interesting. interesting uh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's not something I would do again. Oh. But because we started it and it wouldn't let me go, it wouldn't, I had to write it and then, and now it's fine. Now he no longer, you know, kicks me in the butt and says, but, 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 you've left me hanging. <laughs> oh no. It's, that's another factor or um, attribute or uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for. Nancy M. Bell with, with us today right here. Nancy M. Bell discussing her various books out there, 17 in total. And you have all these characters and situations running around in your head. Like, how do you separate them from reality? I mean, there was a Stephen King book out a few years ago. I think it was the other half or the dark half where yeah. the, the guy, the author got taken over by his his other character and and strange stuff happened from then on. So how do you know what's going on in real life when all these other thoughts are banging around in your brain? Oh, I don't know. I managed to keep it. Um, I managed to keep it fairly grounded. I do a lot of um, of meditation and different things to kind of. It just kind of grounds you. And and there's sort of exercises you can do that can kind of separate you from your characters and different things. So. I just kind of work at that, and when I was doing the Jack the Ripper novel, I was very conscious that I did not want to channel Jack the Ripper. <laughs> like, <laughs> no touchy, touchy, please. No. So yeah, there's there's just different things you can do, and I I often will burn incense when I'm writing, and it just seems to help to balance things somehow. Well, there's another tip for all us uh, would-be writers out there in, in podcast land. Uh, Nancy M. Bell is with us now. You say you're also associated in part with BWL Publishing? Yes. What can you tell us about them? They are a Canadian publisher based in Alberta here. Um, Jude started the company oh a number of years ago, I think 2000, in the early 2000s somewhere, uh, because there's really... In Canadian publishing, very few places for Canadian authors who write genre fiction to be published. Like a lot of the presses are, are more geared to literary, and all the uh, sort of, or a lot of the sort of prestigious awards in Canada are kind of rooted in the literary community. Yes. So the people who write genre fiction are kind of on the out, outside, and a lot of them, most of them, were going to the States to get published. Which is a whole other kettle of fish because you got to worry about um, all the tax stuff and nonsense and trying to get paid and and then a lot of the the smaller you know kind of online publishing houses that went out of business and people didn't get paid and different things and so Jude decided that she would start her own publishing company and just give Canadian authors and we have authors from all over the world so it's not we don't just limit it to Canadians yes but it gives Canadian authors a, a Canadian home basically and based in Alberta yeah she's just she's an Airdrie, Airdrie. which is just Calgary right um, so what is the process you write a book then what happens uh, 
then the hard part starts. Right. Because <laughs> then you have to, you know, you've written it, you've edited it to death, you've had, you know, hopefully a professional editor look at it. Um, you've, you know, you've gone that whole gamut with the beta readers and people finding the plot holes that we don't see because we're too close to it. And having an editor go through and who doesn't know how to do the final edit because we miss things. Our eyes see what we think we wrote uh, and they yes. skip over an extra word or they they put in a word that we've actually missed typing that kind of thing and and the word from is really one of my bugbears because half the time my fingers type form for some reason oh. and it's really <laughs> easy to miss that <laughs> yes and then a spell check would just flag it as not flag it because it's it's the it's right that. word but the wrong context and the wrong well not the the spelling is correct but it's not the word you wanted <laughs> exactly so you've done you've done all that. So you know, and a lot of people think, oh, you've written, you know, you finished writing a book. Or, you know, congratulations. And yeah, it's a it's it's a big deal to finish writing, but the work starts afterward because now you have to figure find a home for it, and it's not as hard as it used to be because of self publishing. Yes, because a lot of people are self publishing now, and it's losing the stigma that it had when it first started. Because when it first started, people were publishing stuff that hadn't been edited properly, that wasn't formatted properly, that was, it was terrible. And it's not necessarily the content was terrible, but the, the presentation was terrible. And so it, self-publishing got a really bad name to begin with, but now it's, it's really um, kind of evolved, and even some of the bigger name authors are self-publishing certain, like short stories and, and different things. Um, Charles DeLint out of Ottawa uh, he has books through Tor and a, a couple of other things, and he's he's like, you know, quite successful Canadian author, and he's uh, started. Uh, he does what does he call them? Triscoll Tales, and they're like chap books that he he started out doing as Christmas presents for family and friends, and he's now self published them as eBooks on Amazon. Yes, uh, my brother Wouldn't lives it, in Ottawa, and I think he knows Charles. So, oh, I love his work. Oh. He's like my favorite author of all time. Oh, Charles Delint. Charles DeLint. It's uh, small D E and then L I N T yes. with a capital L. We'll, we'll let the, our, our thousands of listeners will flock to the bookstores for that. So, what what is your job basically at BWL Publishing in a nutshell? Um, I I do uh, editing for Jude, and then we have a bunch of our books loaded up through um, Ebound Canada, which basically distributes uh, eBooks to libraries and different places, um, Kobo and like all the typical places where they would go, Canadian Electronic Library. There's, I think there's like almost 20 uh, vendors that they will distribute to and they've just started distributing an audio book as well in two or three different vendors. And so I, there's a whole bunch of, um, you have to do like up a big metadata sheet for that for each title and it's got all kinds of, it's a huge Excel spreadsheet. Oh. All and right. so you, that has to be done, and then you pull all of the, the different formats because we upload EPUB, EPUB, PDFs, and Kindle into Course, course Source is kind of the, the background that distributes into the uh, eBound system, kind of, and a, and a cover. So that takes some some time depending on how many books that you're you know how many titles we're doing at a time so I kind of do that for her I do kind of whatever she needs me to do like when she doesn't have time to do stuff or she's kind of stuck I do a little bit of you know gathering information because it's tax time right oh yes I do a little <laughs> gathering information for her from different different places where it's stored on Dropbox and different things for her so pretty much just whatever she needs me to do and uh, BW L publishing with a, a traditional book in a traditional format. How do, are they printed in Alberta, or they're printed uh, by uh, Island Blue Printorium in Victoria. Oh. Craig Schmidt is the um, the contact guy there, and they do a really good job. And they are uh, very very competitive. Like we've we've kind of looked around for because it's a shipping. You know, you want to cut your costs on shipping because books are heavy. Yes. And even local, the local printers that we talked to here, Island Blue is still cheaper, better, and their product is very good. And then how do the books get from the printer to the bookstore? We used to have a, 
uh, I don't know what you call it, contract, I guess, agreement with Indigo, and it kind of has fallen apart at this point. We used to just ship directly to Indigo when they asked, they would send us a purchase order. And right now, basically, if, you know, say if um, McNally Robinson in Saskatoon wants, right. wants some of our books, because our one of our authors is going to go there and do a book signing, or they just want to carry some, then Craig would just print whatever we need and ship them to directly to there. Ah. We're also you can also get print books in the states through uh, Lightning Source. We're we're also on Lightning Source because there's that whole you know trying to get books across the border thing and the right Lightning yeah. Source. Okay. And and different you know different dollar values and whatever so a lot of the u.s will just order directly through lightning source nancy m bell is with us today an author and also works on the publishing side with bwl publishing um i'm assuming you have a, a website because everybody does <laughs> yes yes um you want the publisher's website or my website oh, we'll have both <laughs> we have both yeah mine is um, www.nancymbell.ca and just let me get the official BWL one yeah we don't want to make any mistakes www.nancymbell.ca and all of that is common spelling no tricky letters in there no trickies and the publisher is www.bwlpublishing.ca okay BWL all publishing all one word kind of Great. Well, that's great. Nancy M. Bell, thank you very much for your time today. It just flew by. That's like 26 minutes. Wow. And I hardly got to all my questions, but I'm kind of running out of space here. So. Sorry, I think I talked too much. Oh, no, that's great. No, that's fine. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll get this up and running. We'll let you know the details, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Dennis. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.